We've been going through a sermon series called Hold Your Own. Maybe you've heard this expression, holding your own. Uh, It often refers to a time where you find yourself in a place where you feel opposition, maybe some pressure, or you're at odds with a circumstance. And so in the moment, you're just trying to hold your own. And I, I know Pastor Rob gave the example last week about how he's just holding his own when he was trying to figure out cars and stuff. And I don't even remember all the, the, the terminology that he used. However, I do remember that last week we did talk about encouragement and how to help others hold their own in their own circumstance. We need to be putting courage in and not taking courage out of people. And so we talked about that last week, so you can check that out on our YouTube channel if you missed it. Uh, but today we are going through 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And so if you want to turn in your Bibles, you can do that now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If not, it will be on the screen. And uh, before we even read it, um, don't you find there's a lot of pressures in life? Just think, just think about it. I, I'm, I'm thinking about myself growing up as a kid. Uh, you didn't have any pressures whatsoever. You know, if you were under the age of six, life was good. Animal crackers, playtime, you know, just, you know, mayhem in the washroom. Like, it's just, as a young kid, there's just, there's just crazy, there's nothing really going on. You don't have any responsibilities. There's no pressure, no homework. I mean, it's just free reign. Uh, But as you grow older, you realize, especially when you get in your teenage years, that (laughs) things start to change a bit. You have to do homework or you have to take out the garbage. Uh, You may actually have to, you know, um, drive, and uh, that's a responsibility in and of itself. Uh, I don't know, but regardless, as you go through the stages of life, you have uh, pressures that your parents might put on you. Uh, Maybe you grew up and your pressures, your parents really put pressure on you to get your homework done and do this and do that. And uh, maybe you're at the age where you're saying, well, I'm not pressured. I'm in retirement. Life is good. (laughs) Um, regardless of your stage of life, though, I think a lot of us can acknowledge that we have pressures ongoing all the time, whether that's financially, with our family, our dating or ma- uh, dating relationships, marriage, what have you, we all have those pressures. And so those pressures are big. And yes, it's important to realize that, yeah, sometimes our circumstances are a bit complicated. It's fair to say. But I think there are pressures in our lives that are much, much bigger than we probably think about. So, here's the question we want to ask this morning, is how do I hold my own in response to the pressures around me in our culture? Because our culture is constantly, I don't know if you've noticed, but it constantly pressures us to live in a way that lives for ourselves, right? It's pressuring us through our, the movies we watch, the music we listen to. Uh, we have our phones, and it's like we can access it anytime we want. Uh, that, that in and of itself is so different than probably a lot of what you grew up with, which was, you know, maybe a computer and email, and maybe even before that, you're just like technology. Excuse me, what? Um, uh, regardless, though, uh, there are pressures that our culture has put on us about how the way we should live, which is so different than what God would have for us. And so we're going to dig into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, trying to figure out how do we respond to the cultural pressures around us. So, verse 1, Paul says this, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. So he intros his chapter by saying, we're, not to, we're really not here to please anybody else but God. Case in point, especially if you're a believer, you know that's probably one of the primary things we want to accomplish in our lives is to do things that please God. And he says, this is the way you are living. Now we ask you and urge you, there's an urgency here, we urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. So you're already doing things that please God, but he's saying increase your capacity Continue to pursue opportunities that let you show that you want to please God more and more. And I want to say this right off the top. We don't try to please God to earn our salvation, right? We, we, don't, we don't try to earn anything from God because we know that his standard is so much higher. We could never reach it. But we please God out of a desire to become more like him because he bought us with a high price and wants us to be more and more like him. And so this is the reason 
for why we want to please God and perhaps not the world. Verse 2, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. So Paul's just saying everything that we're instructing you, guess what? It's not on our own authority. We're preaching it from Christ's authority. And so that will be echoed later in the chapter. So why should we please God? Well, we've already addressed that. As a believer, there's this desire to become more like him because he has done so much for us. And so we should want him to be reflected in our lives so other people can see. Um, he continues on in verse 3, and this is where we're going to start getting into the cultural pressures of life. Verse 3, if you want to know what God's will is, here, here's what it says. It's God's will that you should be holy or sanctified. And, you, and we always think this big word holy, like that's an overwhelming word. I could never be holy, like I could never be perfect on any given day. And you're right. The other word here that's used in the New International Version it says sanctify. What does sanctification mean? Simply, it means a process in which the Holy Spirit enables us to, to be more like Christ and to turn from our sin. It's an ongoing process of sanctification to become more like Him. It's God's desire for us to reflect His character, and that's really hard to do with the cultural pressures that surround us. And we're going to get into a specific topic that Paul chooses, and I think is very appropriate for the day that we live in. He says, it's God's will that you should be holy and sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. I can already tell people are uncomfortable. They're like, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? Did he really say that? Yes, Paul, Paul says that you should avoid sexual immorality. In other words, sexual sin. Anything outside the confines of marriage. And why does Paul choose sexual impurity? Why does he go right there? Like, couldn't he just, like, like ease us in a bit? You know, like, start with something small and work your way up? No, Paul just goes for it because he realizes that the believers in Thessalonica, in that day, it was the norm to be sexually active outside the confines of marriage and to worship idols in that way. And so you have to ask the question, okay, well, is that just for their time or does that apply to us today? As I probably said before, you look at the music we listen to, the movies that are available, the TV shows, all those things are available to teenagers these days and even to you. And so maybe if you don't have a phone, then you're maybe living in the dark ages. Uh, not at all, by any means, okay? <laughs> Um, but uh, we, we, most of us have access to phones that we can access at any time, and we can search anything that we want, and with no repercussions. And it's very different than it probably was in that day. In that day, it was very public, very out there, whereas now, we live in isolation with these devices, and nobody sees what we're doing. It's, it's pretty polarizing. In that culture, it was the norm to be sexually active outside the confines of marriage. And so there's this cultural pressure that says, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, as long as you do it for you. And that is exactly what our culture is preaching all the time nowadays. I just wanna quickly give you some statistics as to what it looks like for our teenagers today, for our parents, because if you're a parent in the room, you understand Having kids is a challenge. Um, <laughs> I didn't say that, Summer Chase. You didn't hear that. Um, but uh, the, there's some statistics that I want to share. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of where things are at, at least in the last 20 years. I know that's a big gap, but it's the best I could find. Here's a statistic. 37% of adolescents or teenagers say their parents have more influence on their decisions about sex than their friends. <laughs> So a good majority of friends have a good influence about what it means uh, to be sexually pure or to, you know, how to what that looks like. Third, otherwise, 37% of adolescents have never talked to their parents about sex. And this is the reason, because 90% of parents believe that they have, they, they should have a conversation with their kids, but don't know what to say or how to say it. I can understand the tension. I mean, I can't, let me, let me say this. I'm not a parent. So I don't, I can't only imagine the pressure and the tension 
than there is to try to explain to your kids uh, this is what it means to, se to be sexually pure and this is what it looks like to not be. Like, where do you draw the line? And so that's a hard tension to fight. And so I, I, I empathize with you as parents because it is a hard world that we're living in. Phones and TV and music and all those things your kids have access to and to monitor that and to, you know, just keep them on their best behavior most of the time is hard enough. And so there's this cultural pressure that is telling our kids what, what sexuality really is all about. What's the priority there? Is the priority about sex within marriage or is the priority to just do whatever you want? And so Paul picks this out because it's one of the biggest cultural pressures they had in their day, but also probably the biggest one we have today, especially with gender ideology and all those things. And so what does scripture say about sexual impurity? It says this in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 to 20. It says, run from sexual sin. Paul in Thessalonians says, avoid sexual sin. But in this instance, he says, run from it. In other words, don't, don't see how, how close you can get to the line, but run from it. Don't entertain it. We should be people who pursue the presence of God and not our own pleasure. He continues on and he says, No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your temple is that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. So it's clear, Paul's, Paul's saying, guys, God's presence now resides in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And so to participate in this is actually to sin against your own body. And it it's definitely affects you as a person way more than most sin most sins can because it's so intimate so physical and emotional it's a priority in Paul's mind Galatians 5 17 says for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do see there's a spiritual battle that scripture talks about that we aren't fighting against one another but we are fighting against spiritual powers and principalities and one of the things we're fighting, this tension, is between our flesh, what I really want to do, you know, the cookie jar example, right? I really want those cookies, but I know I shouldn't because I'm on a diet. Um, and, uh, and, and, and what the Spirit wants. Because the Spirit wants you to live within the confines of marriage because it's all about commitment. And when you live outside of that commitment, guess what? Hurt can happen. And, you know, divorces and, uh, you know, dating relationships, they crumble and the self-worth dissolves. And so that's why Paul is mentioning that, you know, it, there, there's a battle going on and we need to be aware of that tension that's happening. So the question becomes, yet again, as, I, as I've said before, how do I hold my own in the face of these cultural pressures like sexual sin? How do I hold my own and make sure that my mind is clear and that I'm focused on the things of God and not on what I want myself? Here's the first thing. Control yourself. <laughs> control yourself. Now, I recognize that when you hear that, you probably think, well, I'm, I'm under control. However, I will say that when it comes to any kind of sin, whether it's sexual sin or not, uh, we have a hard time controlling ourselves even on the best of days because we have this inclination to want to do what we feel is best in the moment. He says in verse 4, Each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passion lust like the pagans or Gentiles or unbelievers who do not know God. And in that matter, no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister. The Lord will punish those who commit such sins and as we told you and warned you before. So Paul's, Paul's saying that we need to control the way that we behave, not just in the, in the, in the confines of you know, dating relationships and marriage, uh, but also just in life generally. We just need to make sure that we are under uh, God's control, and it's not about mind control. Let me just put it that way. It's not as if God's going to come alongside you and take control of you, and you're just going to do what he wants like a puppet. 
There's, uh, there's obviously free will involved in this. Paul actually echoes this in Romans 8 verse 5 about this whole idea of what it means to control yourself. He says this, those who are dominated by their sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled, everybody say control. 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 Those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about these things that please the Spirit. It all comes back to how do I please God? How do I hold my own in the middle of cultural pressures? It's by allowing the Holy Spirit to take control of your mind. The scripture that says that we should take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And so Paul is saying, in order to control yourself, in order to not impulsively do things and to take part in sexual sin or any other kind of sin, the way you escape this is by letting the Holy Spirit control your mind. But he says in verse 6, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. So if you are continually living in sin and you're doing what you want to do, whenever you want to do, however you want to do it, unfortunately that leads to death. Not just physical death, not just eternal death, but also death in your marriage, death in your relationships, death in your career. You get the picture. There's cons natural consequences that happen when we do what we want instead of what pleases God. He continues on, he says, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. And isn't that what we all want? Life and peace, abundant life, peace of mind. You, it's hard to have abundant life and to have peace in your heart and mind when you're, you're, you're just like a pinball, going from one thing to the other, doing whatever you want in your flesh. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. So it really just comes down to who are you trying to please? Are you trying to please God or yourself? That's really what it comes down to. And I'll say this, your free will to choose whether to obey God or not comes down to who you're giving control to. Who are you giving control of your mind to? Are you giving control of your mind and your heart to the things on the internet? Are you giving it to people's opinions? Or are you giving it to God's word? Something to think about. Is everybody still with me? Yeah. You feel the tension? Huh? <laughs> Verse 7, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you the Holy Spirit. So Paul reiterates what he said at the beginning of the chapter. Guess what, guys? If everything that I'm telling you, you reject, and you say, oh, I'm just going to do whatever I want, and this has no, uh, no impact on my life whatsoever, and I'm just going to do me, guess what? Your quarrel and your fight is not with me. It's not with Paul who's saying it. It's with God. And a lot of the times in our minds, we justify why in our own way things are right. But when we look at God's word, it's very clear what he thinks about sexual sin, what he thinks about sin in general. And so if we try to justify it, really we're just fooling ourselves, aren't we? And so he says, yeah, if you reject, if you reject this teaching, you're not rejecting me. You're rejecting God. And that's a huge thing. Because... God holds the standard as to how we should live. And again, it's not about what you should and shouldn't do. It's about having that abundant life and peace that God promises you. And so if you live according to this way, that's what you're going to find. We move on to verse 9. The fact that we're only at verse 9, guys. So it's a fire hose of information, I know, but stay with me. Continues on, he says, now about your love for one another. So we've talked about sexual sin and sin generally, pleasing God and how to face these cultural pressures. And he transitions here and starts to talk about our love for one another. He says this, now about your love for one another, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. If you're a believer, if you've been a believer for any time, you know that Jesus' number one commandment was to love God and what? Love others. And so he, that's what he's saying. But he says, in fact, uh, and he's speaking to the believers in Thessalonica, he says, and in fact, you do love all of God's family through Macedonia, which was the area in which they were, uh, which was modern, around modern-day Greece. Yet we urge you 
brothers and sisters, do so more and more. At the beginning of the chapter, if you remember, he says, look to please God more and more. Don't just settle with what you're doing, but increase your capacity to not only please God, but to also love others. Increase your capacity to love others and to please God. And then he gets into the practicality of what this looks like. And he says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, ooh, stepping on some toes, mind your own business, work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders or unbelievers, and so that no one will be dependent on you. So, my first point. The question we should ask is, how do I hold my own in today's culture? Or how should I live in today's culture? Because there are a lot of things out there that we want to give an opinion about. There's a lot of things we want to do in response to other things. And so how do we go about this in a Christ-like way? First thing, live quietly. Live quietly. Where are my talkers at? <laughs> you just talk and talk and talk. Yeah, that's me. Um, we need to be self-aware of not only what we say to other people, uh, also how we say it, but even <laughs> probably more importantly, when not to say anything. When not to say anything. We're, we're, I'll, I'll admit, like when people start talking about COVID and then other big topics, I was all on it. I was on Twitter and I was giving my opinion. I was letting people know how things are. And guess what? You shut down relationship when you just constantly talk and you don't realize how you're speaking or what you're saying. And so sometimes in the middle of an emotional moment or a circumstance, you need to say, I'm not going to say anything. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to keep that to myself. Because if I say that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurt that person. And I'm going to live to regret it. So live quietly. This next one's really good. Mind your own business. Look at the neighbor beside you and say, mind your own business. Yeah, that's right. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. <laughs> we... <laughs> We need to realize, okay? We need to realize something. We, as a small church, it's kind of hard to mind our own business, if we're honest, because we're so close with each other, and so we want to know, hey, what happened? Oh, what were they up to? Oh, what, what about this? It's not our job to know everything, okay? It's not our job to know what happened with so-and-so last week, and oh, did you hear about that, and what, what about this? And So we're not supposed to gossip, guys. We're, we're not supposed to know everything. We're supposed to mind your, business. mind your business. Mind your own business. Don't meddle in people's affairs. Keep to yourself. Unfortunately, we do a really bad job of this because uh, we have this desire, and it, it was an incredible quote that I saw on Instagram. It said that we as humans have the desires to have the traits of God, which is to be all-knowing, be all present and to be all powerful. I was like, dang, that's me. Wow. That's mind blowing. And so when I think of minding your own business, trust me, I've been there. I, I remember in, as a teenager, anytime someone would tell me something that like had some meat to it, like really juicy stuff, I would start telling everybody. <laughs> there was nothing to hold me back. I would tell everybody because I was like, you need to know this, and it's coming from me. I'm important. You know, I have it all. I know it. <coughs> but we need to mind our business. This is how we're supposed to live in today's culture. Live quietly. Ooh, it's really hard to just not say anything, uh, generally. But also to mind my own business? That's hard. I want to know everything. I, I want to be involved in whatever you're, you're, what's going on in your life. But reality is, we need to mind our own business. Here's the last one. We need to work hard and serve. We need to work hard and serve. That's what it says. Lead a quiet life, mind your own business, and work with your hands. And we need to use our hands to serve and to show good work ethic. To not be lazy and to just settle for normalcy and to, you know, as a church, just let things be what they may because that's just the way things are. We should be pursuing greatness because God is great and he wants to show it through us. 
Verse 12, why, are, why, why should we live this way in our culture today? So that, verse 12, your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. You can't win people's respect when you're doing this all the time. You aren't going to win respect when you're always meddling in people's affairs, gossiping, talking behind people's back, stabbing the back, stabbing them. And you're not going to win people's respect if you're lazy and can't provide for yourself. And I love the second part of it. It's about winning the respect of outsiders, but also not being dependent on anybody. We should be people who are dependable, not dependent. We should be the kinds of people that will say yes and will stick to our yes. Be people who follow through on what we say we will do. Because that will show to people who are outside that we, we mean it. We mean it when we say it. And so that is the way we should live in our culture today. And that's difficult. Because you have opinions all over the place. And you have people gossiping all over the place. And people, some don't want to work. But the point is, is this is how we are to hold our own in today's culture. So, last but not least, before uh, we end our message today, Paul transitions from the cultural pressures of life, how we should live in today's culture, to the question that these believers in Thessalonica were asking, which was, but what about death? What happens when someone dies? Because I, I, I recognize there's pressures in life. I recognize that I have my own. There's cultural pressures around me. And I'm trying to live the best I can. But what hope do I have in the middle of all this chaos and sin? So what do I do to hold my own when I've encountered death of a loved one, whether it's a friend, family member, all those things? Verse 13, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, we do not need you, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Paul uses this term, sleep in death, which is definitely a term that Jesus used in his ministry. If you're if you remember uh, Jairus' daughter there, he uses the language and he says, Stop weeping, she isn't dead, she's only asleep. Everybody's like, what do you mean she's asleep? She's obviously dead. What, what are you talking about, Jesus? Uh, John 11, 11, another instance where Jesus, is, Jesus uses this language. He says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I'm going to go wake him up. The disciples are confused. They're like, what do you mean go wake him up? He is dead, like gone, bye. The whole term about sleeping and death is this idea that death doesn't have the final say. Death doesn't have the final say. That one day, Jesus is going to come back and wake the dead and bring us with him, which we'll read in just a second. But before we get to that, I want to read this important line that says, Brothers and sisters, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. Here it is. So that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Scripture does not say we shouldn't grieve when people pass away. In fact, grief is actually a super important part of who we are as human beings, and it's an important process that we work through. I wish somebody, when I was younger, would have told me how to grieve properly. And instead of knowing what that looked like and getting counseling and help, I, I turned to things like sexual sin. I turned to things that gave me an escape and made me feel good, but didn't fill that void or that pain. Because you see, with sexual sin and any other kind of sin, it's temporary. It's a temporary pleasure that you're trying to give yourself for an eternal longing. And so, I, I remember when my friend passed away. I was only 13, she was 15, and I had to work through a lot of pain, a lot of grief, a lot of questioning about, God, are you really there? Are, are, are you actually with me in this? And so... Scripture doesn't say we shouldn't grieve, but it says that we don't have to grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope because, again, because of what Jesus did on the cross and him resurrecting from the dead, death does not have the final say. Death doesn't have the final say. 
Jesus conquered sin, but he also conquered the grave. And so you can be encouraged at the fact that even though you've had someone who has passed away, if they've confessed that Jesus is Lord, you will see them again. Verse 14, he says, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring Jesus, those who have fallen asleep in him. And then he addresses, how is Jesus going to return? What is this all going to look like when God, when Jesus comes back to make all things right? He says this, According to the Lord's word, we tell you that those who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an arch, uh, the archangel and the trumpet call of God, it's not going to be just this tiny little, you know, little type of trumpet. Uh, the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So those who have passed away will rise with Christ first when he returns. After that, we who are still alive are going to be left and caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Now you're probably saying to yourself, I'm scared of heights. If Jesus returns, you're telling me I'm going to start floating up in the air to meet Jesus? And <laughs> What? <laughs> I'd be terrified. But I think we'd be so amazed, we probably wouldn't even care at that point. We'd just be like, I'm floating, and there's Jesus. Oh my gosh, Like this is mind-blowing. But to conclude, he says, we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage one another with these words. Which is literally what Pastor Rob talked about. We should be encouraging each other that, yeah, I know there's cultural pressures around you. And I know there's your own personal pressures in your life. And I know that life is hard. But be encouraged that Jesus has conquered sin. He's conquered your shame. He's conquered your guilt. You're never too far from God. And one day he's going to return. And so be encouraged that death doesn't have the final say. Be encouraged. No matter, no matter what you face, that you can do whatever God's called you to do. You're not alone. This is how we hold our own in today's culture. Let's pray.